Hello everyone, in this video I'll talk about the assembly instructions and the disassembly windows for viewing the instructions in more detail, so let's get started. Now this isn't going to be an assembly tutorial, that would need its own series. Instead I'll talk about the basic knowledge about the instructions so you can read the disassembly windows, along with some explanations about those windows. I've already talked about and shown the disassembly window in this series. It essentially shows the assembly instructions equivalent of your C code, which directly correlates to the machine instructions that your microcontroller will be loaded with and execute. When your C code is compiled, which again happens when you build your project, it is common, or more common than not, that your single lines of C code will be converted into multiple assembly instructions. Explaining the reason why this happens to an absolute beginner is not easy, but it happens because the code that makes sense to you and seems easy in concept may not actually be that easy for the microcontroller to do. This heavily depends on the architecture and instruction set of your microcontroller, as well as the compiler and its optimizations. For example, a single line of float point operation for an 8-bit microcontroller can take hundreds or more instructions depending on the CPU architecture, and there are many reasons why you may want to inspect this code generated by the compiler. Now, I won't talk about how to debug using the disassembly windows, as I've already done that in my debug buttons video. If you found this video directly, I definitely recommend watching that one too. I've been talking about this disassembly in this series quite a lot, but not really talking about its purpose, or why even use it, and it may seem like a useless feature for an absolute beginner, so I want to clarify a few things before moving on with the series. Before I talk about why you may want to use the disassembly windows, I want to first give some information about them. This code is from the previous videos in this series, but don't worry about the program, as that isn't important for this video. As you know, you can open what's called a disassembly window from the window of menu here, or from the shortcut we added in the aforementioned previous video. Now, as you can see, we can't open it right now, since we're not in a debug session. If I quickly start a debug session, and halt. As you can see, now we can open this window. The program counter doesn't seem to show here unless you execute at least one instruction, so execute a single instruction here. And now we can see the program counter. Now, the reason why you can't open this window without a debug session is because this window is meant for the debugging process, and it only shows the assembly lines for the function the program counter is currently in. In this case, the function is the main. If I look through the disassembly window, as you can see, the digit sum function in our project isn't shown here. And if I step into the function and execute a single instruction here to update the window, as you can see, now it only shows the digit sum function. So this window is designed to be used with the debugging process and gets updated by MPLAB automatically when you perform actions. But what if you want to see the assembly equivalent of your C code without starting a debug session? There are two ways you can do that. The first way you should know by now is by navigating to Window Menu, Target Memory Views, Program Memory, and opening the Program Memory window. I've done this multiple times by now. This screen updates automatically every time you build your project, but as you can see, it's pretty hard to navigate blindly. It shows all program addresses, and you have no idea where anything really is. There is a search feature if you click on this button, so you can look up a particular word or an address, or you can click on this button to jump to a specific address or a line, though again this would be useless if you don't know where anything resides. This window does have its purposes though, mainly when you read a program back from a microcontroller, which you can do by either clicking on this button or this button here. You don't need to do anything special to read a microcontroller by the way, just connect the microcontroller like you would to program it. When you read an unknown microcontroller, you also won't know where anything resides, so it makes sense to see all program memories like this to understand what the microcontroller is doing. This window is also useful when you're writing code with absolute addresses, which refers to putting code or instructions at specific addresses of your choosing, instead of letting the compiler handle it for you. It's also useful when you're using the program memory as a non-volatile memory for your variables, if you don't have an EEPROM module or something, which is something you can actually do by the way. The second way you can see the assembly equivalent of your code without starting a debug session is by checking what's called a disassembly listing file. 
There are two ways you can open this file. If you're already in a debug session, you can right click in the disassembly window and click the disassembly listing file. Or if you're not in a debug session, you can navigate to window, debugging, output, and click the disassembly listing file. There also is a toolbar shortcut you can add, like the disassembly window we added before. When you first try to open this file, you'll likely see this note. Normally, this file is not generated to speed up the building process, so you'll need to follow these steps to enable it. You can either double click this window or open your project properties from here and go to loading. Here, you need to enable the load symbols when programming option. Now, rebuild your project and you should see the generated file. And this file will also update whenever you build your project. As you can see, this file is very similar to the disassembly window, but you can view it without a debug session. Also, it will show all of the code in your project, not just a single function like the disassembly window. However, you can't debug using this file. You won't even be able to place breakpoints, and the program counter will never show up here, so keep that in mind. This file is meant to show all assembly lines generated by the compiler for your project. It's not meant for active debugging. Now, let me explain what the text and symbols in these files mean. Don't forget that I'm using PIC18F46K22 in this series, so it's a PIC18 device. PIC18 is the name of the architecture this microcontroller uses. The instructions available for a microcontroller will be dependent on its architecture, and 8, 16, and 32-bit microcontrollers will inherently have different architectures. But even among the same bit microcontrollers, there will be different architectures, and PIC18 is one of the 8-bit architectures available. To see the instruction set available for your microcontroller specifically, look further into its datasheet pages. There, you'll see the explanation for each instruction available for that microcontroller. But if you want to see the instructions available for PIC18 microcontrollers specifically, type PIC18 instruction set on Google and click this link. Here, you can see all the instructions available for PIC18 devices. This page organizes the instructions a lot better, so it's a better reference than the datasheet for PIC18 devices. And of course, this microcontroller is also PIC18, so the instructions you'll see in the disassembly window will always be one of these. Now, there are a lot of benefits for knowing the instruction set and the architecture of your microcontroller, especially if you care about optimization. There are other reasons as well, but I won't get into those. I won't really go into instructions and architectures here, I'll just explain the bare minimum to get you started. Also, don't force yourself to learn these if you don't plan on coding in assembly. It's best to learn them as you encounter them, if you don't plan on actively using them. Now, the names of these instructions probably won't mean anything for a beginner. These are called mnemonics. You can think of them as the abbreviated names of the purposes of these instructions. For example, if I click INCF here, as you can see, INCF stands for increment F, so this instruction increments the contents of the F register. There are very good explanations here, but again, I won't get into instructions and whatnot. That's out of the scope of this video, and not really that simple. Now, let's go back to MPLAB. I'll quickly open up the three different disassembly windows I've mentioned in this series. Let's start with the disassembly window. Here, you can see each line of our code, and below them, the assembly instructions generated by those lines. This part on the left are the addresses for the instructions. And if I check the program memory window, as you can see, the same instructions are loaded here. These are, again, mnemonics for the instructions. When you code an assembly, you also use these mnemonics, which is why they're shown as mnemonics here. These instructions may or may not require operands, which are these parts that come after the mnemonics. These are essentially the inputs for the given instruction. They may be constants, variables, or flags that change the instruction's behavior. Instructions like nope don't require any operands, as they don't do anything complicated. They just do nothing for one instruction, so it doesn't make sense to give them any inputs. And not every instruction will require the same number of operands as well. But you'll need to be careful. These nope instructions you see here aren't actually nope instructions. Now, I really don't want to get into architectures, since this is an absolute beginner video, but I'll explain this at least. For PIC18 devices, some instructions are multiple words long, meaning some instructions take two or more instruction cycles to execute. 
Word here refers to the length of data the architecture uses by its design. This microcontroller may be called 8 bits, but that refers to the part of the microcontroller that performs computational operations. The program circuitry for PIC18 devices are separate, and it actually uses 16 bits. When talking about computational side of things, a word would mean 8 bits for this microcontroller, but when talking about the program memory side of things, a word means 16 bits, meaning 2 bytes. You can also see this if you check the PIC18 instructions. The encoding, meaning the binary equivalent for the instructions, are 2 bytes long. This also means that each instruction for this microcontroller actually occupies 2 bytes of program memory, not 1. And the 2 word instructions I talked about will actually occupy 2 words of program memory, meaning 4 bytes. The problem is, 16 bits for an instruction isn't long enough for some of the things you may want to do. So some instructions are multiple words long, like call, go to, and moveff instructions. When writing these instructions, you'll write them as if they're a single word, so in a single line, like this. And the second half, meaning the second word, will be shown as a nope instruction, like this. You'll also see some operands that are defined internally by the compiler, so not everything may make sense to you. Now, let's look at the program memory window. You'll see some more information about the instructions here. The lines here are the word addresses of the instructions. Don't forget, each instruction is 2 bytes long for this architecture. So, for a program memory of 64 kilobytes, there will be half that, meaning 32 kilobytes of words or instructions for this microcontroller. The addresses here are the addresses of the instructions in terms of bytes. And if you pay attention, they increase by 2 for each row, since, again, each instruction is 2 bytes. They'll show the addresses for the lower half of the given word that instruction is residing in. The opcodes refer to the actual binary data the instructions correspond to, so the values here are the actual binary data loaded onto the flash memory of your microcontroller that perform the instructions on the right. The labels refer to a group of program. If you were coding in assembly, you would be defining the labels, but for us coding in C, they'll be defined by the compiler. And if I scroll up, you can see the main and the digit sum functions defined as labels. And of course, the part on the right are the actual instructions and operands. As for the disassembly listing file, you also have the C lines and their corresponding assembly equivalent. These are the byte addresses of the instructions. These are the opcodes, and these are the instructions and operands, the same ones I explained in the other windows. Now, I explained these disassembly windows quite a lot, but I never really talked about why you would use them. Assembly coding is considerably more difficult than coding in C, on top of the considerable time it takes to learn the architecture and instruction set to start coding in the first place, which you'll have to learn again if you plan on using another microcontroller with a different architecture. And this is the main reason why not many people or companies code in assembly these days. Compilers these days are pretty good, and the architectures are developed with coding with C in mind, so there aren't many reasons to code in assembly most of the time. The compilers do a pretty good job in general. It's mostly for very time-crucial applications, and even then, usually you'll code in C the rest of your program, and code the time-crucial part in assembly only. And yes, you can mix assembly and C code. But that's out of the scope of this video. You can look up how to do that if you want to learn. X8 Compiler User's Guide also contains information about this topic. So you see, a beginner might think that the disassembly windows are useless, but that's not really the case. The only real example I gave for using the disassembly windows was with the skidding effect, which, remember, refers to the phenomenon where your microcontroller will keep executing instructions after hitting a breakpoint, before it halts. That is, of course, undesirable, since the executed instructions may alter the state of something you're monitoring, and essentially corrupt the debugging process, so it's a valid problem to maybe check. But there are more reasons to want to view the disassembly files. The simplest reason could be curiosity. You may just want to see how your C code gets converted into assembly and machine code. Another reason could be to learn how to code in assembly. You see, learning assembly for microcontrollers can be very tough and time-consuming, depending on your prior knowledge. For a beginner, a good way to see examples on how to use assembly instructions, aside from the official examples and online tutorials, would just be to see how the compiler generates certain code. 
We can make the compiler generate any code as an example to work off of if we can't find information online. Another big reason can be efficiency. Knowing the architecture and instruction set will allow you to write more efficient code in C as well. There are always multiple ways to write the same code, and depending on the architecture and compiler, the generated code for one may be better than the other. With the disassembly file, you can actually see how the code gets generated, and why one is more efficient than the other. Another reason is, well, sometimes you just need to look at these windows. They are very useful when developing a bootloader, for example. But bootloader is definitely a more advanced topic, so I'll just leave it at that. This also applies for when you plan to use some portion of your program memory as a non-volatile memory for data storage, like a pseudo EEPROM. But again, I'll leave it at that for now. And that's the end of the video, and thank you for watching. If you liked the video, you can always leave a like and subscribe, it's always appreciated, and I'll see you in the next video.